Welcome back to the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. I am Derek Rackley. I'm with my guy, Dave Archer, and I'm with... Oh, wait, we got a different guy over a here. substitute teacher. We got a sub in the house today. <laughs> All right, Which welcome Scott Bear, digital managing hard editor. Right hander. Yeah, it's 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 all right. Like, cause DJ is gone. He's with Fox. He's covering the Braves That's as right. they start the playoffs. So we just we had to go to the bullpen. Yeah, exactly. We had to bring in the the. Uh, would we call this middle relief or are you like a closer? Oh, I'm definitely the closer. Oh, he's no. definitely kind of short, a short statured lefty oh, coming wow. in, all power. You all realize grit. what you just did, oh, right? Like Put you set some yourself stuff up behind the ears. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, what we might call time in the middle just to come check it out, but. But like as the close, that means you got to bring the thunder here. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Scott's on our uh, final whistle on the Atlanta Falcons podcast network. You've probably seen him many a times there. But he's jumping in on a Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. So, guys, here's what we're going to cover. No doubt we're going to talk about the conf- controversial call. I'm sure you've been talking about it ever since the play happened, nonetheless, uh, since the game ended. Why did the Falcons struggle to pull off a win? There's a number of reasons that we can get into. Um, what they're going to have to do to change some of those things that they didn't do to get a victory in their next game. And then we'll talk a little bit about some roster moves because it does involve a pretty important uh, Falcon uh, in Deion Jones. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. So, guys, let's talk about the, the questionable call because – uh, it's something that not just Atlanta Falcons fans, not just people that have watched the game, it's become a national story because of what happened in the game and how it ended up changing the complexion of the game. So Dave, without us getting into pointing fingers and truly getting into what our personal feelings or maybe the colorfully what we want to say, what do you feel like needs to happen in the future to avoid not stuff like this just for the Falcons, but for all 32 teams in the NFL? Well, that's a that's a there's a lot in there, right? Yeah. That's a lot yeah. to unpack as far as what you think you might do to try to fix this or find some salve you can rub on the wound because you can bet that Kansas City has got some of that problem again today as well. Yeah, that's what happened in yeah. their game last night. So um, obviously, there's an education piece to this. I know that they've tried to do that, Scott. They've tried to teach some of these guys as to how to tackle. Evidently, Grady used the form that they suggested that he use. Um, all that being said, I think that what you've got to do is they're trying to protect the quarterbacks. We get it. Sure. Um, there's got to be a degree of violence and or, you know, ex- extra on plays that I think they're going to have to discern via instant replay Mm -hmm. i think it's a play you're going to have to look at much like targeting is looked looked at in college football i think that's really the only way you get get some resolution to this it's certainly not going to help us in what happened this last weekend uh but that's really the only remedy here is the league's going to have to look at it from a competition standpoint so this is not what we intended by protecting the quarterbacks in the pocket uh because we're missing some stuff and we're missing stuff that affects games. This one affected the game. Yeah, Dave, because we could sit here all we want. And even as players, like we would go back after a game and and I can talk to this as, as a specialist, right? They always want to point the finger at the kicker when the kicker misses a game. Right. But then the discussion is, well, there was four or five plays that you could have made earlier in the game to change it. Right. Yeah, you could, there was plays that the Falcon Scott could have made earlier in the game to change the outcome. But in the NFL, where there's so much parity, where the you don't see 49 to three games like you do in college, there are sometimes games where there are battles that all of a sudden in the fourth quarter, you just need a couple things to go your way to get back in the game. And it looked like Atlanta was right there. They had all those things kind of going their direction. And all of a sudden, this call just completely changes the complexion of the game. Yeah, especially you have to look no farther than the Falcons' schedule over the first five weeks to see that things come down to the like to the final seconds. And ultimately, this is another one of those games where, yeah, you can point to things that happened in the first quarter and the second quarter, but we saw the momentum shift and we saw the Falcons come back, really start to... To, to get some life inside of it. And then that call eliminates that possibility. And while I'd like to say some very colorful <laughs> things, a lot of them with four letters, um, <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm going to rely on Grady Jarrett here as opposed to what I think. And Grady was on his radio show. Nobody likes me reading a long quote here, but I will try to paraphrase it and just go to some highlights. And what he said on it, on his radio show is I'm not saying that it costs us the game, but it cost us an opportunity to go win the game. Sure. And I think that's the most important point. He also kind of says, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. 
right? I didn't do anything bad, so let's give the game what it's owed to put the best product on the field, and that's what drives him crazy, Mm -hmm. is that if something looks malicious or penalty-worthy live, let's let a camera weigh in on this thing. Let's try to let cooler heads prevail and get the call right. We've seen an improvement and steps in the right direction with certain plays, even with pass interference Mm -hmm. uh, from what happened to the Saints and the Rams, right? Well, let's take that next step. Let's try to get the game right. If the game goes an extra 15 minutes, but they get the call right, I think everybody's happier than they are right now with, with the outcome. Ultimately, as you point out, directly affected by a flag that hit the field. And I will add and in in scott's all over this and, and appreciate the quote from grady and bringing that um most of us just want consistency yeah okay and yep. i think that's really what the league wants is they want consistency in whatever happens interpretation of the rules how guys wear their uniforms they want consistency yep. right this was this situation with the quarterback protection wasn't called consistently in the game, Correct. let alone throughout the league. Yes. So there's a consistency issue that they need to get to that I think might define things a little better for defenders, but it's certainly from a coaching standpoint, you know, potentially what's coming yep. and what you can teach in practice. The, there were so many tweets. Social media was on fire after this. Maybe we'll get a chance to sh- so show you some of those from some some organizations, from some national talking heads, if you will. Everybody's been talking about it. You guys kind of talked about the replay. And I'm with you because you think about the NFL instant replays at stands. I don't think anybody has any issues with the way that the NFL instant replay is right now. Not that it, because they don't say it slows down the game. They don't say that it takes away from momentum because I think, like you said, people want it right. In, in, in the NFL, they want the games called properly. So if they can go to the college role where they review targeting, no matter what, every, anytime it happens, they review it and either they take it away, they leave it as is, but getting the call right. And that's maybe the direction the NFL has to go. Well, I think that we have to be careful in saying get it right because there's a lot of times we look at the replay and I say that's not right. You know, so my interpretation of the replay might be different than yours or different from mm-hmm. Scott's, but the thing that you get as a team as a as a team and fan is you do get them to look at it. Mm-hmm. It's not just an arbitrary call by someone or you know whoever, whatever game it might be in, and then that's it. The law is the law that we're done. They do – it gives you an opportunity to go back and review it. They can slow it down, take a look at it, and then if they still come to the same conclusion, you may argue with that as well. Yeah. But at least you get the, the idea – that they spent some time on it. It wasn't just an arbitrary call and that's it. And we move on. Yeah. You know, we talked about like form tackling and doing it right. And Grady even mentioned like he did everything that he was supposed to do guys. I remember them talking about this, like right when I finished playing back in 2006, 2007, 2008, remember they were talking about heads up tackling and, and Pete Carroll was doing all of this stuff with the Seahawks and everybody was watching his videos and we're in 2022. And I still don't know if there's a proper definition of how you hit somebody. And I mentioned to you guys before we came on the air, I'm an offensive guy, right? I actually used to play the quarterback positions. Normally I'm on the show with two mm-hmm. quarterbacks. I am about protecting the quarterbacks because these are the guys that are getting paid 20, 30, 40 plus million dollars a year. They changed the game, but it's also still a physical sport. I understand people want to say, oh, this is football. Those things. Okay. <laughs> that type of narrative narrative is over, right? I understand it's still football. But it's so difficult to play on defense right now, whether it's pass interference, whether it's rushing the quarterback. There's got to be so many things that these guys try to think about in the heat of the moment. And you think about how quickly these plays happen, how quickly that all developed for Grady Jarrett to get to Tom Brady, get him down on the ground for him to think, oh, wait a second. I need to make sure that I fall a certain way so I don't get called for a penalty. To me, it kind of takes away from the playing football just fast and free, right? Like that that's usually when you play the best is when you just react, Dave, right? You just go out there and you make plays on the football. So we could talk about this for hours. Obviously, we don't have that much time. So let's let's move forward, Scott, and let's talk about maybe some of the other areas of the game that right. got Atlanta behind the eight ball. What are some of the plays that stuck out to you that Atlanta got off to such a slow start and kind of spotted Tampa Bay a 3 TD lead? Yeah, I think a lot of them had to do with penalties 
really that that are that were kind of indisputable, right? Like you look at a face mask penalty yeah. that, that that slows them down offensively, um, defensive holding earlier earlier in that same drive, and I and there was a drop by uh, by. Felipe Hodge. Franks and yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and and Hodge that that slows down the moment the offensive momentum that yep. never really got going early yep. on. Um, so I look at first downs by penalty drive me insane. Yep. And I think Arthur Smith insane that, that that when you look at those things, they were never able to get into that good rhythm. How often were they playing from third and eight, third yep. and thirteen? Where yep. on the opposite side, Tampa's playing at third and three every time they had 29 plays in the first half. So um, those are the things that really stick out to me. Self-inflicted wounds and putting yourself behind the sticks, I think uh, ultimately slowed them down early. I wrote this play down arch uh, or a stat, if you will. Um, the, the television broadcast talked about it. They said plays in the opponent territory. I had written it down 140 left in the third quarter. Atlanta had seven plays in Tampa Bay territory and Tampa Bay had 32 plays. It kind of mm-hmm. kind of goes back to your point how Tampa Bay stayed on schedule. It was almost like Atlanta was always fighting the chains, fighting mistakes, even from the first drive of the game. The potential interception to A.J. Ter- uh, Ter- Terrell, he, the ball's in his hands, right? And granted, it goes through yeah. another player's Tough hands, catch. but Tough like catch. one of those where maybe that sets the tone. If he makes that play, it kind of changes the momentum early on in the game. Yeah, no, there's no question. It was a tough catch. It went through the hands of Russell Gage and hit him right in the chest. But, I mean, those are the – you. we do drills in practice where mm-hmm. you get the blurred drills where they go through guys' yep. hands and you drop them in practice too. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that makes it difficult. Um, what stuck out to me in the first half was Atlanta probing – Trying to how to trying to figure out how to block Tampa. Mm-hmm. Tampa got touched up for over 180 yards on the ground against against the Kansas City oh, Chiefs. Yeah. You know Todd Bowles is the defensive coordinator and head coach. That ain't happening to us nope. anymore. We're going to crowd the line of scrimmage. They were playing with eight-man boxes most of the first half. And Atlanta had a tough time figuring out how to block them. Antoine Minfield made three tackles in the backfield, the yes. free safety, Extremely early active. in the game. They're stringing plays out. He's coming up off the edge. There were a couple plays where Atlanta had designed, and they had enough people to block except for the safety. Or except for we, we confused it, we blocked the safety and didn't block the other guy. So I thought the adjustments – that Atlanta made moving through the game to try to go ahead and continue to run the football. You had 52 yards rushing, I think, at halftime. You made, you finished with over 150 yards on the ground. So, obviously, that talks about the staff and the players adjusting. Now, the only way that can happen and stay in the game is for your defense to kind of hold on to the rope. Yeah. And to me, that was the best way to describe this defense is they were, you know, were, were described as a bend-don't-break defense. That's fair. But they were holding onto the rope. You get an unbelievable stop early in the football game on third and short, fourth and short in your own territory that turns yep. Tampa away. Yep. Get a great stop right there. And that's who this defense has been. When you look at the numbers, they're in the top half of the league in red zone defense. They've been moved on. There's points or there's yards being racked up. They're 25th, 26th in the league in yards given up. But when you get down in the red zone, they stiffen and they do a really good job of using the perimeter of the end line and the sidelines is that extra defender and they hem you in and do a good job of forcing field goals. And that's what they did in the first half till Arthur Smith and his offense could get untracked so they could figure out how to block. And when they got blocking figured out, all of a sudden now Tampa's on their heels. You get three consecutive three and outs defensively. And here comes the wave of Atlanta coming back, but that's the ebb and flow of the game. And that's complimentary football when one side's not kind of carrying it. Can the other side kind of hang on to you can figure it out? To me, that's a compliment to the to the players, certainly from a from an intelligence standpoint. But it's the staff, and we've seen it for five weeks now, changing what they're doing in the game to fix the problem. Mm-hmm. They've done it for five consecutive weeks. You can go yep. to every game, and yep. they've made some kind of an adjustment in the game that's given them the opportunity to be close late to win the football game. It's a resilient team. That's one thing I actually wrote it down. Like as I'm watching this game, they, they fight, right? And it's, you know, no disrespect, but in years past, maybe you didn't see the same type of fight when things weren't going their way in the game. But it's almost like you look at this team and you watch the way that they're playing, even if they're struggling. 
they still feel like they got a chance to win it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we saw in the second half, Scott. Like, this team doesn't give up. They continue to fight. They're kind of playing with the personality of their head coach that just – you watch him on the sidelines, and he's just – he's always competing in the way that he's calling plays. It's refreshing to see that. But at the end of the day, we understand what this business is. It's about wins and losses, right? So you can sit there and say they're resilient, they compete. But Arthur Smith is telling the guys – that we have to find a way to turn these into W's, right? So my question to you is, slow start, right? What are some of the things that you've seen that need to change for them to get off to a better start, not only in the first quarter, but in the third quarter, because you get some of these quarterbacks, like a Tom Brady, like an Aaron Rodgers, if they are hitting on all cylinders early, you're going to find yourself in a deficit. And I just don't think this Atlanta team is built to be able to say, we got to throw the football 52 times now. So what adjustments do you think need to happen early on in the game so they don't find themselves in these type of holes? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go back to a, a conversation that I had with Jake Matthews right, like, right after this loss. And it was another one of those things, well, yeah, we fought, but that's not good enough for us anymore. Yeah. And I think that's a sign of good coaching and a sign that they're raising the stakes. It's growth, now. yeah. And, and Jake kind of talked a lot about it, and a lot of it was finding a good rushing rhythm early mm -hmm. and staying on schedule. Um, uh, Marcus uh, Mariota talked again about first and second down execution, yep. and I think it is a combination of, look, they are who they are. They're going to run it down your throat. They're going to be innovative with pre-snap motions and misdirections and, though, like, yep. and those types of things, yep. but can they have a complementary passing game that moves the ball down? down the field that I think has been lacking over the like over the like last two weeks. Can they run, run, strike you deep? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, can they scare you and can they keep you honest? Because Dave is exactly right. You looked at that box and you're like, there isn't room for a <laughs> sardine in here. The, the, the way that, that, that they were packing in. And so I think if they can establish the run, get that play pass going and then start to create big strikes downfield. That's what we saw against the Seahawks more. Uh, that's what we have haven't seen as much the last two weeks. So Dave, where, where did you see the turning point, which is one of the areas, one of the reasons why I love the game of football, because to me, it's one where momentum is so big in this game. Like you can find yourself in a hole and all of a sudden two or three plays happen in your favor. And all of a sudden you just feel things shifting as you were calling the game. Where did you feel things start to shift? There were a couple of things that happened in the game. Uh, they went to zone read, which they really were doing a pretty good job of defending. I mean, you when you watch the game plan for Tampa in the first half and even some into the second half, whenever Marcus came out on bootleg, two guys shattered him. Yep. They were trying to cut off his ability to get outside, one to throw it, and then his ability to, to run it. So Arthur had to find a way to get his quarterback involved in the run game and they went to a couple of zone read plays, and Marcus ripped off about a 25-yard run right through the gut of the defense yep. and got it out up over midfield. Yep. I thought that was a turning point. The Avery Williams punt return was huge. Yes. I mean, you get a short field opportunity, you pin them, your defense comes out, and it might have been the second, maybe the third three and out in a row, but you get the short – it was the second one, I believe. You get the punt, you get the punt return. So, again, another phase of the game checking in to try to help the offense, kickstart the offense, give them a short field yep. opportunity. Yep. Those are two plays that stuck out to me as far as kind of in the second half began to turn. Um, I, I think that's what I would point to. I think that there were some things they were trying to figure out because of the box and how many people were around and who you're supposed to block. There were extra defenders there. As much as you'll say, hey, they didn't do anything different than what we expected. Well, then you got to play it. And there's there some guys that <laughs> yeah. are going to make plays. Winfield's a good player. He's an instinctual player down around the line of scrimmage. Yes. You know, and to get him blocked is is saying, you can say it, but then you got to get him blocked. <laughs> you got to do it. And so I think they figured that out. So I, I give a lot of credit to the, the team. And I give a lot of credit to the defense in Dean Pease. I know people were talking about the defense and, wow, you know, they're bleeding us. They're bleeding us. Well, there's, this is an offense, and you know as well as I do, Tampa is a big strike offense. They yep. want to take your shots yep. down the field. Yep. He wants – he it, it drives him crazy. I give Brady a ton of credit for being patient. Yeah. Because he threw the ball underneath, threw the ball underneath, threw the ball underneath. Atlanta was giving him that because they didn't want to give him the strike right. down the field. And so – that's tough in this league to string plays together to score. Look at the score at the end of the game. They yeah. scored 21 points. They scored two touchdowns yeah. in the game because they were made to put plays together to score. And that's the part you got to keep in mind when you say, oh, they're killing us underneath. Are they scoring? Yeah. Now, 
the other side of that is they're eating up clock and taking some of those opportunities away. Certainly in the first half, Atlanta evened that in the second half by moving the football and getting some things done themselves. It's interesting you say that because I remember when Brady did type, try to take a strike downfield. Remember, uh, he went for Scotty Miller on the right sideline and Casey Hayward was all over him. Beautiful yeah. play. Beautiful defensive play to not get pass interference right in his hip pocket. They talked all game long about the speed that Miller had getting downfield and everything. And they had a one-on-one -on -one shot and he made a play. That was when Brady was trying to take his chance downfield to get the big one on the board. And Hayward um, had the ability to, to knock it free. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. Guys, let's talk about next week, okay? We, again, we could probably sit there and dissect this one sure. as much as possible. But it, um, as we are taping this, it's Tuesday, right? So mm -hmm. Atlanta has already changed gears and they're move, moving forward to San Francisco. So three and two 49ers, Scott. Give us a little bit of sense of what Atlanta is going to be facing with San Francisco this weekend. I actually covered that team right before I took this job. Oh, so, so you got all kinds. This is the so, closer, yeah. y'all. Here's the closer. So He's yeah, bringing it now. Uh, they're actually staying on the East Coast. They're staying in West Virginia between the victory over the Panthers and when they uh, play the Falcons. This is a team that seems to go through a lot of injury issues. They're having some troubles now with Nick Bosa and maybe even their uh, kicker, uh, Robbie Gold. They lost one of their starting cornerbacks. All that said, they're still pretty good. Yeah. And they can still play some pretty ferocious defense and seem to be able to get after the quarterback no matter who's along that defensive line. They are ferocious, and the Falcons' offensive line is going to have to deal with that. They're also going to have to deal with a guy named Debo Samuel, yeah. who we've all heard of, who Arthur Smith gave as about as nice of a compliment as you can possibly say in that he's a football player. Yes. Right? It doesn't matter how big he is. He's a football player, and he's another guy that's going to have to be accounted for. And as Falcons fans already know, Kyle Shanahan's run game, it's pretty good. Yeah. So there are a lot of things for the Falcons to contend with during what I believe is the most difficult three-game stretch of opponents that the Falcons will see all season. It doesn't mean this is an impossible task. Jimmy Garoppolo, I don't have a ton of confidence in, mm -hmm. if I'm just being honest. So how, how they navigate a lot of these challenges, how they take advantage of areas where they do have su uh, superiority, can, I think, go a long way in how this game goes. You know, I called a South Carolina game a number of years ago when Debo was there, and I remember preparing for the game one and then calling the game and telling myself a number of times, like, gosh, this is a really good football player. I'm surprised that more people aren't talking about him. And then, of course, I knew he was going to be an NFL player, Dave, but did you see that Debo Samuel was going to end up being the guy that he is in the NFL right now? No, I think that it, it gives give Kyle Shanahan a ton of credit. Yeah. Much like we talk Arthur Smith and we talk about Dave Ragone and what he's done with Cordero Patterson, that's essentially what they're doing with Debo Samuel. Yeah. They're using him everywhere, right? And Debo a little bit more of a receiver as opposed to lining him up in the backfield, although they will line him up in the backfield. Anybody watched their playoff run a year ago, saw him line up at tailback, and they handed him the football like a traditional tailback would get the ball. They're not doing that as much so far this year. It's more jet sweep stuff. It's more quick screen stuff. But he's a guy in space type player, and he runs like a running back. He's yeah. very difficult to get on the ground. He's frankly what everybody else in the league wants. They want one of those guys. Yeah. Our guy like that just happens to be banged up. Right, so that, right. that's the problem there. So what you're going to see is a mirror image of yourself on offense. This is a very similar offense. You're going to run wide zone. You're going to run a lot of stretch plays. You're going to get the quarterback booting out. You're going to run play action. What have we been seeing on yeah, our offense? The, yeah. the one thing you won't see with this offense that you see with ours is you're not going to see zone read with a quarterback. Mm -hmm. Now, they might get a keep off of a bootleg, but they're not going to run Garoppolo. Remember, Trey Lance was their starter. He's yeah. out. So you don't yeah. necessarily want Garoppolo to go down. And as Scott mentioned, he's a little bit iffy when it comes to not just play, but his health. This yes. guy's had a tough time staying on the field. 
they're not going to want to disrupt what they think they've got going by getting the quarterback banged up. But I think you're going to. I think that bodes well for the Falcons from a from a defensive standpoint. You have a pretty good idea of what you're going to see. Now it's you got to go stop them. Scott mentioned they are get after you up front in the run game. They mm-hmm. want to come downhill and run the football. They've got a couple of good runners that can do it. Not Debo Samuel, but a couple of other guys that can run the rock with some speed and quickness. The part that I will be interested to watch is this is I talked about it at Cleveland Atlanta did an unbelievable job with Cleveland's three count screen game I don't know what it is about being able to run the football but your screen game also factors into that San Francisco's outstanding they they scored a touchdown on a three count screen against Carolina from about the 20 yard line and when I say three count screen what I'm talking about it's a thousand one thousand two and now some linemen get out in front back circles in behind you, dump the football, and here you go. After you've dropped off in coverage, they're outstanding with that. And that's something Atlanta has been very good about. In fact, even snuffed out two screens in this last game yep. from Tampa. And I think they tried it eight times against in the Cleveland game, completed one of them, and that was the play Jalen Hawkins knocked the ball out yep. of David Njoku. So screen game going to be a big deal. And they'll run the screen all the way down to about the 15, 10-yard line. Yep. So you got to be careful in the red zone. Atlanta's been so good down there in playing their zone coverages, you're probably going to see screen down there close. Got to take care of that. So that's what you're looking at on the offensive side of the Dave, ball. Dave, you mentioned the screen game obviously is big, and and they've done a pretty good job against that. How big and, – and the reason why I'm going to ask you this question about slowing down Debo Samuel is they faced a guy last week in Mike Evans that if you let him, he can take over a game. And I felt like they had a pretty good game plan of making sure – even though Mike Evans would have four catches, 81 yards – but he didn't take over a game because Mike Evans can do that. Is Debo Samuel the same type? Is that going to be a similar concept for them defensively is don't let Debo beat us? Well, different nut to crack completely, right? Because you're talking about Debo can get the ball anywhere. Evans is going to line up on the outside and they're going to throw the ball to him. This is a dude they're going to hand it to. They're going to throw quick stuff to. Um, So it's a completely different nut to crack. Do you have somebody shadowing him? Who is that player? You know, I don't know that A.J. Terrell necessarily draws that assignment because I think you're taking A.J. out of coverage down the field. And they got other guys that can make right. plays down the field. Yeah. You know, Ayuk is an outstanding receiver. They got a tight end that's a pretty good player, too. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand. <laughs> that so, kill guy. So, yeah, so there's there's other weapons on the field. So it would be interesting to see what Dean Pease comes up with. Make no mistake, <laughs> there will be a focus on number 19 and wherever he's lined up, they'll have an idea where he is. All right, so Atlanta knows a little bit about the um, – West Coast slash East Coast trip that San Francisco is doing. They did one earlier this season. Um, so they'll get to somewhat return the favor for a team that's going to stay out uh, on the on the East Coast the entire week. Back on home turf uh, against San Francisco 49ers. Final story here, Scott. Let's just talk real quick. Um, news came out this week that Atlanta Falcons traded away a pretty darn good player. Deion Jones. Yeah. Of course, uh, spent some time on the injured list, and they decided that it was time to move on from the veteran. 650 total tackles, 428 solo, 11 interceptions, maybe one of the more athletic linebackers that I've seen in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, I guess I'll just serve it up to you as your initial thoughts when you heard the news that Deion Jones no longer going to be in a Falcons jersey. Yeah, I, I go back to what Terry Fontenot said at the NFL Scouting Combine about all of the major big uh, contracts that, that that they had to deal with, right? With Matt Ryan and Grady Jarrett and uh, Jake Matthews and, of course, uh, Deion Jones. And they've now touched all of these contracts in some way, shape, or form. Now, th- this Deion Jones, what's going to happen with him thing has been a storyline forever. Yeah. And I'm happy for the team and the player that this has been resolved in some way, both – in that they were able to get a little bit of compensation, but they were able to help themselves out tremendously from a salary cap perspective, more so in in 2023 and moving forward. And Deion Jones has an opportunity to go play somewhere else where they've clearly restocked at that inside linebacker spot. So I think just having resolution is a good thing. I think you look at it and you think six round pick in 2024, that's, that's something that you can get. But I look at the salary cap benefits as something that is important. But just because this storyline has been going on, 
I'm really glad that, that you that you referenced Dion the way that you did. He gave so much good service to this organization. 100%. I don't think that 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 can be lost in the fact that sometimes breaking up is hard to do. Well, I I had a chance to call every one of Dion's games here in Atlanta. He came in as a rookie in 2016. He was part of an upstart defense that had four rookies starting on it. Uh, it was a team that went to the Super Bowl. He was a big part of why they went to the Super Bowl, even though they weren't great on defense. He had a bunch of young guys like Keanu Neal, who we yep. saw this last weekend, making plays. Uh, I can tell you that I watched him play. Now, he's been banged up the last couple of years, and some of those skills, from what I can see, have diminished some. He was the best cover linebacker in the National Football League. Yeah. There was no question about it. I His saw ability him line to up. run sideline to sideline, cover players, 100%. I saw him line up against Alvin Kamara and completely shut him down. Yeah. And he knocked him out of the game one time here a couple of years, three or four years ago. So, but uh, no one will ever forget the interceptions. Of course, the one that closed the show when uh, for Jameis Winston in overtime, he picked the pick six that closes the show there to beat Tampa in the final game of the year a few years ago. And then, of course, his interception, his first interception came in New Orleans that he took back for a touchdown against Breeze. But maybe the probably the most iconic interception he had was in the end zone in the color scheme game was on a Thursday night. Uh, New Orleans was here. It was always fun to beat New Orleans. And Dion closes the show with an interception in the middle of the end zone with those bright red uniforms on, makes the grab, goes up high to make the interception. So I just want to pay homage to Dion yes. Jones because an outstanding player. Um, I think that the Falcons have done the right thing here, make no mistake, because uh, as Scott said, this, this linebacker core is a young, pretty cool linebacker core, and they're coming. Get ready now because that's going to be the strength of this defense pretty soon. It may be already the strength of that interior. And so you got an opportunity to give. And I love what Scott said. You gave Dion an opportunity to continue his career in another spot, fresh start for him because he deserved that. Mm -hmm. I love um, that you and I think the same way because I didn't even really have a chance to, to tee you up. You took it right from Scott. And my question was going to be to you, Arch, give us a few of your best memories of Dion and you just went there. So yeah. I appreciate you doing that because he's been a great Falcon during his time here. Obviously I talked about his stats, did some great things. And um, one thing I know just from my time in the league, you've been around it for a long time, Scott, I'm sure you, the same way. There are decisions that are made from a business standpoint that a fan may not always agree with. Mm -hmm. Even as somebody that covers the team, you may not agree with, you might say, this guy could still be in this uniform. A lot of people probably felt that way about Matt Ryan, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes this is why it's a difficult job being a general manager, but you have to manage things that are in the best interest of the team. So not only is this a good move for the team, but it's a good move for Dion, as you guys said as well. And we all wish him the best because mm -hmm. he's a tremendous player and he deserves the right to go out and show people why he's such a good player. So that's it, guys. Hey, great job closing it down. Yes. I uh, appreciate you bringing in the nuggets about San Francisco because you know a little bit extra about that. Mm -hmm. See, you know there's always going to be a time when you can come in and you can throw that nasty splitter. You know what I'm saying? You know what? Just right in the dirt, swinging <laughs> right over it. It's beautiful. Shockley, you're on notice, man. <laughs> this seat's real warm where I'm sitting. <laughs> so we, we don't know if we will have Shock back next week. All depends on the Braves. He's got his responsibilities with Fox, but thanks for holding the seat down and offering your perspective <clears throat> and anything. Once again, that's Scott Bear, of course. He's with our digital media team, Atlanta Falcons Podcast Network, of course, on the final whistle as well. You've probably seen him many a times. Thanks so much for joining us. That's going to wrap it up here on the Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. Dave Archer, Scott Bear, I'm Derek Rackley. Continue to watch our podcast on whichever platform it is. Like, subscribe, review. We appreciate all of that. Oh, go Braves, <laughs> baby. Just keep on doing that, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. See you next time.